Coming up, a Sad Styles production. Hello and welcome. My name is Mike Aaronworth, signing on to the Sign Off, a Frameworth podcast for yet another week. It is the podcast where we talk about all the stories you didn't know you wished you knew about the world of sports and sports marketing. I am joined in studio across the table from someone who looks like he's been through the ringer. I have um, a little bit of a sore head. We were in Pittsburgh last night with the Crosby celebrating the big 500 goal, which uh, will be this, I guess, will be airing after the fact but uh, it'll be airing after the fact uh it was a late night it was it was a late <laughs> night but that is brian Aaronworth, president of frameworth sports marketing uh, my loyal co-host some would say the main host of the podcast no, depending on who it. you ask uh we're going to be talking to someone uh, today who may be able to give you some exercises that you could do to relieve some of that <laughs> headache but we'll get into that in just a little bit before we get into our guest who's waiting patiently in the wings uh quick shout out to our loyal listeners who have been supporting us so graciously on the podcast platform spotify and itunes remember if you haven't yet make sure to go out there leave us a five-star rating and review it goes a very long way plus you might find you've won yourself something like in today's case a apple podcasts review from jim thtffg not sure what that stands for but you're gonna have to let us know it's an inside joke uh simply sensational he says five stars best podcast going thank you very much we tend to believe so as well i haven't missed an episode and the only issue i have with it is i wish there was more as a massive penguins and crosby fan i love hearing stories about him keep up the great work well one day soon dad we're going to have to get into it about what happened uh, the night of his 500th goal. Well, there's some we, stories there some sure. of it I can tell you too. And actually, since we're, I'm leaving this podcast, going straight downtown to do a signing with the guys as they arrive in Toronto for the game tomorrow uh, against the Leafs. So we'll have some interesting stuff, uh, new stuff signed from different players. And you'll, you'll receive one of those items um, from the, uh, well, I had a uh, Jake Gensel eight by 10. Oh, there you go. So there you go. Signed and ready to go. So all you have to do, Jim, uh, as, as, as some people want to pronounce it, apparently is reach out to us, sign off pod at frameworth.com. You got 30 days from the release of this episode and we'll get that sent out to you free of charge. The other bit of housekeeping that we have to do is we promised, uh, we had a, a, a mystery series box, of mystery boxes, Pittsburgh Penguins, mystery boxes out on order. And we said that if we sold out the series, then live on the podcast, podcast as live as a podcast can be we would do a an announcement of a winner all you had to do was purchase the box and if you purchase the box you put yourself up there to win a signed Sidney Crosby jersey and the winner is we did a draw through random.org using the order numbers it is Alan Kragoliak 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 Let's say Kragoliak Alan Kragoliak Alan doesn't matter because we have his address and it'll go to him e- even if he's not uh, listening today, but he should be listening. But you should be listening. So thank you once again to everyone who participated. Keep an ear out and an eye out for more promotions like that. Yep. Uh, but enough about Frameworth. You know, that, that can only go so far in this podcast. I'm excited to get to our guest today. He's dedicated his life to improving the quality of yours and athletes like you both on and off the ice. During his over 20 year stint with the NHL, he was the head athletic therapist for the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Phoenix Coyotes and was stationed at two NHL All-Star Games, as well as the 1988 Winter Olympics in Nagano, Japan, not to mention representing Canada in various additional world championships across the world. It's a pleasure to be speaking today with the now director of the Toronto Athletic Club Clinic for Sports Medicine, Chris Broadhurst. Chris, thanks for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Great to see you guys. It's yeah. great to see you as well. It's been a while. My back's been pretty good since I used to go down there to see him, so I haven't seen him in a long time, but I, I, I used to be a regular customer. I was so going to say not to... We used to have your whole family and never mind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Not, not too many of our guests have, uh, have, have seen me with my shirt off. So that's one thing that you have <laughs> on most other people who I've uh, interviewed in the past. And also sitting in front of some lovely frames, uh, you can see in the background, if you're watching over on YouTube, uh, some frame worth frames as well. A nice little backdrop there. Yes. Uh, so, Chris, I want to get into this because as, as we mentioned at the at the top of the episode, there are tons of podcasts out there that want to talk to the athletes and the players and talk about their history and their playing days and what happened on the ice just recently. We're more interested in the businesses and the industries that exist around sports that don't necessarily have to do with the day to day uh, goings on of, you know, uh, one NHL team versus another. And and you're a perfect fit for that because your industry is one, I think, that a lot of people may not even realize uh, exists in the backgrounds. It's But but without it, I think we would have a very different looking realm of professional sports. Uh, I want to know a little bit about your background uh, in terms of you obviously 
practice medicine and and you lean more towards the world of sports now and we'll get into your involvement with different teams and leagues but what came first your love of medicine or your love of sports uh well what came first was injuries when i was young so oh. i i uh i certainly uh, played hard in all the sports that i did uh, born and raised in oakville ontario and uh I just love sports in general like uh obviously favorite was hockey um back then ball hockey was you know, around everywhere. Um, and, uh, just, just really intrigued by the whole area of, uh, sports medicine and, and injury prevention and all those things. And, uh, was fortunate enough to go to a uh, Sheridan college. Um, they had the, at the time they had one of the only sports therapy programs in Canada. And, uh, so I went straight out of grade 12 into the college program. There were a lot of, uh, a lot of the people in the program were from a university background. So, I was pretty young when I started it and uh, they called me the kid of the class, but um, I got a lot of great mentorship there. And when I graduated, was fortunate enough to get into the Blue Jays organization and uh, realized after a year of that, that, um, you know, I still needed to learn for one. So I went in a clinical setting and second thing that uh, baseball wasn't my true passion, although, mm -hmm. I, you know, the organization was fantastic when I was there uh, for the year, but um, I, I just happened that. Hockey then came onto the forefront um, a couple of years later, and, and that's been the fit for me. So hockey was always your sport growing up as well, the one that caused most of those injuries you were talking about. Yeah, like I was a, a Leaf fan through and through growing up. So, yeah. uh, you know, to, to land that job with the Toronto Maple Leafs too was uh, – was definitely for me anyways, a, a dream come true. Well, it's interesting. We talked to a lot of people who ourselves included, we got involved in our kind of corner of the sports industry, ours being memorabilia and marketing at a time when there wasn't a ton of competition. So, you know, it, it's one thing to say that you've carved it out now, like there exists tons of memorabilia companies and, and tons of sports medicine clinics, but it seems like what you're saying, you know, there was one program at Sheridan College. Was this a relatively new industry at the time? And and therefore, was it very competitive? Like were, were other people who went in your program immediately getting jobs with organizations like the Blue Jays straight out of school? You know what? It was a very new organization, or sorry, uh, uh, set up with Sheridan College. Um, in regards to the Toronto Blue Jays, the reason I was hired on there was they didn't have any Canadians in their organizations oh. from, uh, from a sports therapy standpoint. And so I was the first Canadian that they hired um, with the intention down the road, you know, that uh, I could potentially get up to the major league level. Uh, no, nobody forewarned me they were going to win back to back uh, World Series. So. <laughs> were so, you with uh, the team at that? Because it was 1986, I think you started with, uh, right. with the organization. How, how long were you there for? Just, just a year. I okay. was just a year, but I was able to go to spring training. Um, I was able to see how the organization ran. I mean, it was incredible. You know, when you think of hockey, you have the Leafs and then you have their farm team and then you have junior A hockey and baseball. They had six farm teams at the time for the Toronto Blue Jays. Right. To make it to the, to make it to the big league club. So I was in the minor leagues. Um, I, uh, I saw a lot of athletes from all over the world. It was amazing. At that time, uh, we had a very strong Dominican presence. Right. So, uh, I learned. Do you speak Spanish of... now? Or just, <laughs> just all the swear words. Just, just <laughs> swear words. Like I, I can strike out with the best Dominican there is. <laughs> well, ouch is, ouch is kind of universal. Yeah, yeah, so. Universal language is ouch. Um, it, exactly. But, but, it, it, you know, the amazing part with the Blue Jays organization, what it taught me in baseball is. Um, for most of them, how long it takes to get to the major league level. You right. got to go through sort of six tiers to get there. And uh, and coming back into hockey, you know, um, there's a lot of time and energy that goes into these guys making it to the NHL, but but the depth of it isn't nearly what it was in baseball when I started. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, all the different leagues around, in this case, the Toronto Blue Jays. You know, making your way to the majors is not just a matter of being affiliated with the team. I was curious, too, about your start and the start of anyone who's getting into sports medicine. I know this is the case with referees, for example. You have to make your way through the minor leagues before you're allowed to, to referee in, in the majors. Is there a similar path that you have to take uh, through different leagues, or is that a traditional way that you start? Or in your case, like just going to work for the, the the Maple Leafs afterwards, is it essentially just apply for whichever job you want and hope you get picked by the NHL? Uh, you know what? I'm, I mean, for me, it was unorthodox. I never did the minor leagues in right. hockey. Um, I was in a clinical setting, and uh, I came back to Toronto to a, a clinic with, that was run by a orthopedic surgeon. His name was Dr. Robert Jackson. Uh, he was actually the 
surgeon that brought arthroscopic surgery to North America. So oh, wow. he's, he's uh, infamous throughout the world. Um, he was great learning experience for me. But they, uh, the other caveat with that is they did the medicals because they were at uh, college in Carleton. They did the uh, medicals for the Toronto Maple Leafs that year. And uh, one of their goaltenders came in uh, with a back issue. His name was Ken Riggett. And uh, was able to, uh, they, they sent him my way. Um, and I, I was able to treat him for two weeks. And that was that season that the Leafs got off to a crazy start. I think they were like 10 and 0 to start the year. And Kenny was really great in that. And um, he was from uh, Lethbridge, Alberta. And uh, he got to talking to Wendell Clark about, you know, my, my services. And, uh, you know, Wendell talked to Guy Kinnear, who was the head trainer for the Leafs. And, they set up an appointment for Wendell to come over. And at that time, he'd been, been out over a year with a back injury. And, and uh, so I got to start working with him. And I was I was really young. I was really green at the time, but uh, um, really excited for the opportunity. So for me, it was really right place, right time. And uh, my relationship with Wendell, obviously, from a treatment standpoint, when he got back playing, I was able to go on the road with the team and travel with the team and start treating other players, too, um, under the – guidance of Guy Kinnear, like he was the head trainer at the time. And uh, so he really showed me the ropes. And um, Brian Papineau was the assistant equipment manager. So when uh, Harold Ballard had passed away, uh, you know, Brian Papineau went and became the head equipment manager. And I was a head therapist and we were the two youngest in the NHL. So it was, it was exciting times in Toronto for us. Now, were, were your classmates from Sheridan College looking at you, you know, one year out, you're with the Blue Jays, and then the following year, you're with the Maple Leafs. Was this was this common, or were they looking at you like you had a horseshoe up your ass that, that you're getting yeah. these, these positions? Like, what what is, is this, is this something that you expected, and were, were people jealous, or, or is that normal? Uh, I don't think they were jealous. I think, you know, at that time... Um the the whole uh, athletic therapy world in in Canada was very new, mm -hmm. so they were just excited that they were getting profile people into these positions. And um, you know, there were other athletic therapists that followed me with the Blue Jays organization, and I'm proud to say with the Toronto Maple Leafs, there's still athletic therapists there uh, in the organization. So um, you know, if I shone the light for some of them coming through, then then that was great. Um, obviously, with the Leafs, I was there like 18 years in total. So um, that was a pretty good run. And then uh, went down to Phoenix for three. I uh, really enjoyed my time down there. Uh, Cliff Fletcher was with me down there. So there was a nice alliance there again. And I think I remember seeing you at one of the Gretzky fantasy camps here. That's right. You kind of look yeah. like you did today. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, though. <laughs> at, at what he does is amazing because even to talk about those camps, as an older guy, and you get, you get there, and it's one thing to go out in the ice and do a little stretching, but then I learned to go into the trainer's room and just get stretched out and worked right. on, and you're a whole different person when you hit the ice like that. They know what they're doing, boy. Yeah. You just feel yeah. completely yeah, the, different. The thing about Wayne is everything's first class, right? So Yeah, it, yeah. I, you know, it's amazing some of the people that go back there year after year. Uh, yourself was one, but Brad Jansen comes to mind too. You yeah, know? he's been on the podcast, and well, one of the one of the more uh, frequently referenced uh, characters, I'll, I'll call him, uh, a to have appeared on the podcast and b to be constantly referenced by people who know him. Yeah, uh, 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 just an absolute character. By the way, if you're out there listening and you haven't heard our episodes with Brad Jansen earlier on in our run of things, but make sure to go check those out. Uh, you mentioned something interesting, and and I'm I'm kind of curious about the way in which sports injuries manifest themselves uh, in, in some of your clients. You said that your first client on the Leafs, at least, was was a goalie. Is there a position in hockey that tends to come away with the most injuries or need the most attention? Uh, and it can't be the coach because you can't deal with their, their mental struggles. <laughs> yeah, no, the, co the coaches have other issues. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, I, I don't know if it's really positional. Um, you know, it's, it's really the type of play. Like... Uh, it's always said about Wendell, for instance, that he was, uh, you know, a 215 pound player playing in a 185 pound body. Like he right. could be very aggressive. And, and, uh, I remember his first game back, uh, in the NHL after his back injury, his first shift, he went out and did an open ice hit. And, you know, I asked him after why he did it. And he said, I just wanted to test my back. So it was, like, <laughs> he was gonna, he the was poor guinea go pig. Out. Yeah. Yeah. He, he didn't temper his way into any games. That's for sure. Um, and, and some people are just, you know, um, 
prone to injury, just the way they play there. Um, but having said that, uh, I would say through my time, uh, the goalies, you know, are, are amazing in one way in that the team, like they're, to me, they're one of the most valuable players on every team that I've been with. When we, when we've been successful, our goalies have been the ones that have held it together for us. And, uh, so I had great, and you've been holding them together. So that's, uh, yeah, mutual. that's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, so I, I was fortunate enough, you know, I had Grant Fuhr, uh, initially, and then Felix Potvan came in and, then Curtis Joseph and Eddie Belfort. So we had some pretty good. Those are some good years there. Yeah. Oh, some great years. Yeah. So. And it must be a, a pretty intimate relationship that you develop with each of the athletes. Do you, do you, I mean, you're, you're not quite as involved with, with the Leafs or the league at this point, but do you maintain these relationships that you had had? Do, do some of the players still come to you based on all the uh, success? I know, I know, for example, there, there are, uh, uh, I was reading uh, Andre Agassi's book, Talking about, you know, being fixed by the right person one time and never wanted to see any, anyone else. Kerry Goulet, who we had a couple of weeks ago, same thing with him. Do people kind of follow you around because they trust your what, what you offer them? Yeah, there's certainly there's a word of mouth uh, that's out in the marketplace. Um, you know, uh, it's funny. You, you don't feel old until you start treating the kids of the players that you used to treat. So I right. think quite a bit of that. And, uh, <laughs> right. You know, which is also neat to see because they want to know the stories of their dads when they were playing. And, uh, you know, so it's 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 kind of really a, a unique community. Um, I still do some work with the Leafs. Uh, uh, Paul Ayotte, who's the head uh, therapist for the team, um, you know, he uses me as a sounding board sometimes, but he also... Uh, allows us to come in at training camp to help with the medicals and stuff. So, you know, but it's, it's totally different now. I mean, uh, the staff that they have now, uh, compared to what we had as our staff is, is just totally different. So. Right. Well, I want to, I actually do want to, to pull on that thread just a little bit because times must have changed a ton from, from when you first got involved in, in, in the early to mid eighties to now, everything has changed in regards to not just, uh, uh, rehabilitation, but preventative measures being undertaken, the amount of science and studies. I mean, if people think that uh, stats driven hockey are changing the way that they approach how they build a team, I'm sure that the back office team of, of therapists and people involved in maintaining the longevity and health of these players must must be equally as complex uh, and, and move that much more into the future. I'd love to use that to kind of talk about longevity in athletes nowadays. I mean, specifically, you worked uh, out of the Bobby Orr Sports Medicine Clinic from 88 to 90. And I want to use him as an example. Bobby, Year, uh, Bobby Orr, a, a guy whose career got cut short. Had he been given proper preventative and rehabilitative measures during the time that he was playing, do you see him as an example of a player who could have had a much longer career uh, or, or are some players just doomed to see these results based on the way they play and, and the, the injuries they maintain? Yeah. Like from, from my end of it, the two things that really changed was uh, seven, the 72 series seeing what the Russians had brought to the table, you know, as right. a hockey team and how they trained and how disciplined they were in, in their approach and how close it was in that, in that series. That was sort of a wake up call. Yeah. Um, the second thing that's uh, with Bobby Orr, you know, uh, his knee injuries, there weren't any surgical procedures that could fix those knees back when he was playing in his prime. So right. when I see some of the videos because I never got to see Bobby live. But when I see some of the videos of Bobby Orr, it's incredible. He could do what he was doing on those knees. Like to me, right. that's just amazing. You know, exactly. And so uh, for sure, we've come a long way from the days of Bobby Orr because you, you hear of, you know, guys like Connor McDavid, for instance, to be able to come back, he was even non-surgical to right. be able to come back to the level he has come back to is, is amazing. Yeah. There was no arthroscopic back then. I don't think Steve and, Stamkos, another guy who broke his leg and came back relatively quickly as well. Um, those, those sorts of, of improvements to the processes, uh, you know, we talk about the changes to the teams that are brought in place to make sure that the athletes and the players kind of maintain their, their longevity and, and their health. But what about your practices in general in the realm of sports marketing? How has that changed since you've, you've come into it? Maybe technologically, maybe in terms of your, your mentality on, on preventative versus rehabilitative measures. What have been the main changes since 86 when you first started with the Jays till now? Well, I, I'd say the first thing is the internet. So every athlete goes on the internet to, you know, look up. What Self-diagnosing? They yeah. So uh, Dr. Google, we call it. So <laughs> as, as uh, people in the profession, we need to keep up with everything that's going on today. You know, the 
all the things that are going on from a regenerative process uh, also, right. you know, to keep these guys playing. I mean, you're seeing more and more player. Like to me to see Yager playing at 50 is amazing. Right. And, uh, yeah. um, you know, and back in uh, when I was in the league to see Chris Chelios, even in his forties was incredible. Like right. I just thought that was a, an incredible feat. So to yeah. see more and more guys playing into their forties, um, they have to take care of their body. And, and you know, Chris, when I, I I remember when I first came to see you, I think you were down with uh, Dr. Clarefield's uh, operation there at the time. So, Chris, another person who yeah. seen me with my shirt off. Yeah. Yes. So <laughs> at the but what I I remember from the first time I saw you to the to the years later when I came back to get some more treatments, things like uh, like acupuncture and that mm -hmm. were being used, which were never used back then. So uh, that's I guess some of the things. And what's the thing where you put the cup Copping. on? Yeah, cupping. Yeah. yeah, cupping, and and I was surprised. As, wow, this is like voodoo medicine, but <laughs> but you believe in it, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if, it, if cupping's good enough for Gwyneth Paltrow, it's good enough for you. <laughs> <laughs> Next, you're going to be uh, selling candles that smell like your body parts, just like Gwyneth Paltrow as well. Uh, exactly. That's Gwyneth Paltrow, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We, we, but no more, the, no more. The amazing thing, even with acupuncture, like you know, um, they're using that in China on on surgical procedures, right, as an anesthetic. So right. It, it stands to reason that it's going to work in, in the realm of professional sport. But those are the kind of courses that, uh, you know, um, people in the sports medicine industry take now. Uh, and they're very mainstream because you're, Brian, you're 100% right. Like back in the 80s, that wasn't mainstream. Right. Was right. there a hesitance to adopt a uh, more of a, a naturopathic approach to some of this? I mean, you, you mentioned, which was really interesting, was the shift in perspective on how to build a hockey team, not just in terms of the players on ice, but their training, the staff around them when you saw the Russians play. And I think at, a, at an earlier time, especially around then, there was a very much an us versus them mentality. You know, in North America, this is how we build our teams. This is how we treat our injuries. And as someone who's coming along and, and seeing the data and seeing some science and, and some statistics that show that something like acupuncture, traditionally uh, a medicine that's not used in North America or a treatment not used in North America, did you find any resistance to adopting these, these measures? A, because maybe they thought they wouldn't work and B, because they said, no, our methods are, are better? Yeah, I, I think each each athlete um, comes in and, and uh, most of them are open minded. They just want to get back to play. Right. Right. And I think things like acupuncture, for instance, and you talk of naturopathic type uh, uh, therapies, you know, when you look at all of the um, issues with uh, addiction to pain pills and whatnot, I think some of the players, uh, even when I was in the league, were getting more and more um, approachable because they, they didn't want to take like painkillers. They didn't want to take anti-inflammatories and things right. like that, uh, especially long-term. Um, right. So I, I would say even today, looking at all the regenerative stuff that's available, um, players are, um, are definitely looking for alternatives to just, you know, getting meds. And what is the process in turn? Like if, if, if you're brought on by an organization, organization, like you're working with the Leafs or the Coyotes and you have a new method that you would like to use, it's one thing to convince the players of it, but is there also some red tape around the team kind of keeping their hands on you and making sure you don't stray too far? Or do they kind of hire you on just to trust everything that you're going to do and not question it? Yeah. Well, when I started, it was, it was with Harold Ballard. He didn't question anything. So <laughs> 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 no, uh, uh, the, the biggest thing was um, it, it was interesting because when I started with the Toronto Maple Leafs uh, there was a real philosophy at the time anyways they didn't believe in rehab right it was like you came back when you were ready to play right and so I was I was certainly something completely different than than the medical philosophy they had with the lease organization so uh, when I first came on and then when I was brought on as the head therapist and Doug Carpenter was our coach, he allowed me the opportunity to sort of uh, build the sport medicine model the way we wanted to. And, and it was really successful for us with the Leafs for, for all those years. And um, But, you know, I look at it today, it's like entirely different again. You know, like for myself, I had an assistant therapist and we brought a massage therapist in once a week, you know, right. to, on an off day to help with the players. Now, you know, uh, they, they've got like, when you look at the team roster list of, of people that they have in that dressing room, they've got everything from, uh, you know, uh, psychotherapist to, uh, you know, physiologist to strength and conditioning to uh, regenerative. 
um, tissue massage, all those things. Like it, it's uh, it's a lot more intense today than it was back when I was playing. But right. um, I got to be honest with you, it also allows you the opportunity to see how tough our players really were. Like pound for pound, you know, guys like Doug Gilmore and Ty Domi and Wendell and Gary Roberts, you know, those kind of guys like – for I look at what we were able to give them and that they still got up and played. It was, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Hey, you know what? You mentioned Harold Ballard. So give us your best Harold Ballard <laughs> story. You got to have one. Well, Everyone's yeah, got yeah, one. I definitely got he's, one. He's the Lorne Michaels of the hockey world. Everyone's got a story about him. No, know? I definitely, it was my first year and uh, I was in the training room working on a player and uh, Gary LaRiviere, who was the assistant coach at the time came running in and I am, um, most people know, like, uh, Harold lived in Maple Leaf Gardens. Like, he had yeah. an apartment there. And Gary LaRiviere came running into the training room. He said, Chris, you got to grab the oxygen. Harold's upstairs. He's had a heart attack. So I grabbed the oxygen, and we're going up the escalator of Maple Leaf Gardens. And uh, all I can think in my mind is, I've just started with the Leafs, and I'm going to kill the owner. Like, oh, no. this is, <laughs> is going to be a short-term career. And Whoa. <laughs> So we uh, got up there, knocked on the door, and Yolanda Ballard opened it. And uh, I walked in to expect to see Harold on the floor. And he was having breakfast at the breakfast table. And I guess he had told Yolanda he wasn't feeling well. And she just assumed that was a heart attack. So, <laughs> so I, I, that, was, that was probably like two months into my stint with the, uh, the Leafs. And I, I just remember, like, when I came back to the dressing room, I was just breathing a sigh of relief that, you know, uh, he, we, we had him go get checked by the doc and everything. And he was fine. But, um, you know, it was always exciting around Maple Leaf Gardens with Harold. Like everybody he was had an a old school guy. Eh? Yeah. The things that he was sitting in that bunker and, and I met him a number of times when we started out, we were, he was still around and, uh, in 92 with this company or even before then, cause I was working for my dad's company and his office was amazing. I, you know, you'd, if you ever got into his office, he had memorabilia and all it was but he was a character i'll tell yeah. you and there's yeah. hundreds of good stories about him well you mentioned chris about 18 years or so working with the lee or with with the team with the toronto maple leafs is there a one year in particular that stands out it could be you know everyone's getting injured and there's nothing you can do about it or it could be the team's doing great and you felt you had a hand in it any any particular years that kind of stand out to you there well i just i just think the year where uh, pat burns took us you know so far in the playoffs and the, uh, you know, uh, that Detroit series, Detroit was the top of the league and, uh, and we were supposed to go out in four and, and all of a sudden we're coming home up three, two and, and, uh, the city's feeling pretty good about us and we're feeling pretty good about ourselves. And then Steve Eisenman put on a show that night and now we're going back to Detroit for game seven and that game seven. I mean, I still watch it every once in a while. I just can't believe how exciting that game was because. Um, you know, both sides were just back and forth and, and um, it was great hockey and, and uh, we, we, uh, we stole game seven. Which I, was I was at that game too. We oh, drove down. I went with uh, Jeff Newman, who used to be in the oh, yeah. uh, marketing department and Juice, who was at, at, in the, what was it? Doug Laurie's store or whatever sure. it was at the time. And we took them down and like the real sports of that era. Yeah, yeah. And then we, uh, but what a game. Yeah. Um, uh, Nicky, who is who scored the winning Borshevsky. goal? Nick Borshevsky and he had, Borshevsky. He had a uh, he had a shield on because he had uh, fractured his orbital bone a couple of weeks before, so that was just his comeback, and and he was uh, he was gritty. That was an exciting game, and I was right behind the net too, so it was what, really. What changes in the playoffs for you? Is it? I mean, everyone knows everyone plays harder in the playoffs, right? right. Injuries, people playing with injuries, even nowadays. You know, you talk about how things have changed and. and and players were just expected to go out and play back then. But it seems like even nowadays you find out, you know, like Patrice Bergeron playing with a broken leg or, 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 or punctured lung or something along those, Sean Thornton with the broken leg. Um, what, what was that like for you? Did you know there had to be an added level of effort on your part and maybe an added level of, hey, look, if you're okay, you can go out there. Was, was there a shift in mentality during the playoffs for you? Yeah, well, I guess the, the common line you always hear, even now in hockey is, you know, if it was a playoffs, it'd be playing tonight. Like, Right, in regular right. season, guys sort of, you know, make decisions based upon there's going to be a tomorrow. And a lot of times in playoffs, there's no tomorrow. Right. Now, you know, you also have to realize that uh, player safety, um, you know, like uh, we had to make some difficult decisions 
uh, with the organization of not playing players that wanted to play, but mm-hmm. we were out to protect them. For sure. Um, and so, um, you know, that comes into play. And then, then it's the psychology of it. You know, it's, it's the ability of, of putting a player in a position where they feel confident enough to go and play the game that they want to play. And um, so in playoffs, there's a lot of psychology behind the scenes that goes on and, and uh, just the tension and everything. Like when people say, what do you miss the most about being in the NHL? It's the playoffs for me. You know, they, really? yeah, yeah, the playoffs for me. So is there an element of learning the personality of the players? Like you talk about working with Wendell Clark and Doug Gilmore. There's got to be a part of you that finds out you're going to be working with these players and like, sure, it's exciting to watch them, but holy shit, you've just made my job a lot harder by existing on my team. I've got a lot more work to do. Are there, is there an element of learning their personalities to know how much you can push them to know that when they say they're not in a lot of pain, that means a ton of pain to most people? Yeah, they, um, there is an element of that. I mean, uh, both both Brian Papineau and myself were really lucky. Uh, uh, one of our first years there, we got to go to Canada Cup. So right. I had Mike Keenan as a coach, who, is, who isn't an easy coach to have if you're a medical guy. Um, so, <laughs> so I learned I learned quickly with Mike Keenan, you know, um, a lot. And uh, and just having all those superstars like uh, Brian had remembered those Canada Cups up in Collingwood. We'd have a roster of 56 guys. Like you could add two Canada Cup teams and. Right, they would have vied for the championship. You know, they were that right. good. In fact, uh, I think our last cuts were like Gary Roberts and Steve Eiserman. You know, off that. That's team. pretty tough. tough when cuts. You can, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so just being around those kind of guys and and Wayne at the time and Mark Messier and guys like that, and um, you, you just get to learn about you know how to uh, deal with those guys and and and, and at what level. Um, but what I was really appreciative, even guys like Wayne, you know, um, he'd want to he'd want to sort of get my advice or, 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 you know, as a sounding board and stuff like that. And those kind of things were a big thrill for me because, you know, you always think these guys just know everything, but they 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 lean on you. And, and that's what the support team's all about. Be it the equipment guys, and the medical guys is the players, you know, uh, do have their insecurities and. And uh, I think the whole mental health thing that's gone on in sport now, I think oh, is yeah. wonderful. Um, yep. I think it's, it was a long time coming because um, we got to see it behind the scenes, but it was never really out in the public eye. And, right. But uh, there's a tremendous amount of stress that's put on these athletes and uh, they need people as sounding boards. So. Yeah, and I know we uh, it's got to be a bit of a shorter episode because uh, I know you got you got to get going in a little bit, but I would like to touch on that just a, just a little bit. You know, the, in this realm of of sports injuries, especially as it pertains to CTE, concussions, neurotrauma, that sort of thing, and 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 the subsequent effects on on mental health, there's this whole conversation about like, is it almost is it worth it to be putting people through this? Um, at the time, you would. I'm sure, as you mentioned, been dealing with a lot of this, the mental health, the struggles with, with a player's own uh, sensitivity to injuries and, the, and the, the, the pressure to play even though injured. How much of that affected your ability to perform? And were you aware of some of these or, or did you suspect any of these links between something like a concussion and mental health? Did you, did you start to put that pattern together? Or as the literature started to come out, was this also uh, new to you? Yeah, I think... You know, the tough one for me always was the enforcer's role. I thought they always had a tough, tough time with it. I mean, to me, it's it's not natural to want to beat up another human being and right. have to do it. Unless you're Ty Domi. Unless yeah. you're Ty Domi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, uh, the, the, the big, I just always found that, you know, to be a struggle for them, uh, you know, to have to, to know what they had to do on a night to night basis. Um, yeah. And so that that one was where I became aware. Um, and, and then the concussion ones, I think the biggest part was the, this is all for a lot of the players. This was their dream. They were living their dream. And with concussions, it's not like a knee injury where you say, you know, six weeks and you'd be back playing. Right. With concussion, you just don't know sometimes. So I, I think the whole unknown uh, was a big stress, especially when they had families and whatnot. Um, you know, it still is probably a big stress for a lot of the players in the league, even though, We've come so far with it. It's it's uh, the unknown. 
And For back sure. then they didn't make the kind of money, so they couldn't really afford to miss six weeks or, or a season because, you know, they weren't making the millions of dollars. Well, that, the scary thing is now. even even money aside, I mean, you have players like Daniel Carcillo saying that he would trade his Stanley Cup rings away if he had never had a concussion. I mean, it just, it gets, it's it's not even money. It's it's the dream. They spend their whole lives trying to be these athletes and then realize at the end of it, that it's taken such a big chunk out of their life post career that they they question whether or not it was worth it. Um, I we don't want to keep you too much longer, uh, but but I do have one question to to lead out on. Um, something that our fans always they they love these sorts of things. Who in your mind? You mentioned a lot of Wendell Clark. Um, who would be the the least suspected person, but the toughest person that you've worked with in terms of their ability to deal with injuries? Uh, to deal with injuries or toughest like. The, the sneaky tough one for me was always Todd Gill that not enough people gave credit for it, like uh, when he was playing. Do you have a Do you have a Todd Gill story that'll uh, that'll work to, well, just, to that purpose? Just uh, you know, a lot of a lot of players would take him on the first time, not thinking he was that tough, and and uh, he always held his own. Um, sure, sure. And uh, so from that perspective, but I, I'd have to say from from an injury standpoint, you know, Wendell certainly is right up there with anybody. I mean. Uh, the kind of injuries that he dealt with throughout his career. Um, and yet he kept coming back was amazing. I think, uh, you know, Gary Roberts found the whole fitness, uh, side of his game in order to keep him playing. Uh, so right. his dedication to the, to staying fit and getting back from injuries in order to play, uh, was, was right up there. And, um, believe it or not, Grant Fear, you know, like, uh, fears he had a, uh, a lot of injuries specifically to his knee a lot of times and, uh, I remember one time he had a, a puck shot off a collarbone, which is every goaltender's worst nightmare. Oof. And it was a contusion. It wasn't fractured, but it, you could tell it was sore. He played with it, you know, and wow. uh, he just found ways to compensate with his game in order to play proficiently. So Fierzy was right up there with the top. Hasn't one. affected his golf game, though. He's, <laughs> he's like on tour right now. Wow. I, you know, it's it's interesting to hear these stories because I always imagine, you know, we talk about as as people in the memorabilia industry, the way we watch games change because there's a narrative that we would love to be able to sell, you know, whether it's a certain player scoring a certain goal at a certain time or against a specific team. It The way we watch it and the things we look for changes you as someone who's looking out for injuries and, and especially after having treated someone knowing the lingering injuries someone's dealing with must be incredibly difficult. But all these insights, I, I'm fascinated by it. It's, it's a side of, of sports that I don't think... It, enough people have an insight into we didn't even touch on your your time with phoenix and you know if yeah if you got more time in the future we'd love to have you back uh but we're gonna let you get going uh in the meantime is there anything you want to shout out any any websites or or social media you want to point people towards no no just uh i mean if anyone has any issues that they want to deal with through the clinics um you know they can call the uh, toronto athletic club sport medicine clinic and uh, our phone number there is 416-865-0903 I'm old school. I give out phone numbers, not hell. There you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know what? If you want to go to a guy or a group of people that have worked on the best athletes in the world, uh, they're available. Exactly. And, they, and he runs a great clinic. So I've been there many times. We got a great team down there. And, and you get to see all the framework stuff up on the walls down there. Too. So <laughs> as, is, as you're getting this, uh, this is your our Mississauga out. location. So we're like, we're like your uh, showroom on the road. <laughs> <laughs> we love to hear it and we love to see it in the background and we love to have you on the podcast chris thanks for taking your time out of your busy day for talking to us we appreciate everything you've done uh, so for chris broadhurst and for brian aaron with president of framework sports marketing my name is mikey aaron with host of the sign off podcast and this is us signing off well, ladies and gentlemen, we made it to the end of yet another episode. Thanks again so much for joining us. You can find videos of all of our episodes on YouTube by searching The Sign Off Podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter at Frameworth Sport or Instagram at Frameworth Sports. And hey, if you're not sick of me yet, you can find me on Twitter over at, at Retrograde Mikey. Or you can always find me embarrassing myself over on Instagram at Aaronworth. The Sign Off is a proud product of Fadu Productions and Sad Styles Productions, executive producers Mikey Aaronworth and Andrew Bascom. Until next week, this is Mikey Aaronworth, signing off. Furnished by Sad Styles Productions. Get into it!